church and we're here to sing about Jesus. Yeah! Yeah. 
into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces grace is waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted grace is waiting where the spirit Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom, let there be freedom. Freedom. 
alongside this is uh, prayer and feasting we're just we're just pouring into the Lord before the new like academic calendar starts and we're just pouring in and seeking after him and spending time with him so if you guys uh, take time and come 6 a.m. right here um, we'll just be praising the Lord and spending time in prayer um, a few more things we have small groups are gonna be coming up soon I'm gonna be in charge of that so if you're interested in leading a small group come talk with me we can we can talk about what it, that looks like um, we can talk about location, all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me. I would love uh, to, to get your name down and, and, and see about having you lead a group. Um, this Thursday, we are being working with Connect Church. We're trying to get some lights done. Um, we've already fixed some lights where it's not the blazing sun hitting us in the face. Um, we're, we're working on things. And so this Thursday from 6 to 9, if you guys have, have time, come up here and it's just a work day. We're going to be working on some things, trying to get more of these lights working, get more of this electricity run, and we could use all hands on deck. So, so come up here Thursday, anytime, 6 to 9. Uh, you show up at 7, that's totally fine. We would love any help that you can give. Um, and the last thing I want to put on your radar is, is Labor Day weekend. Um, we're we're going to be partnering with, with Upper Room from Dallas, and, and they're going to be hosting a worship night here, just a, a deeper night of pouring after him. And we're, this whole place is going to be filled with people and we could use some volunteers for that. So if you're interested in volunteering, you, you'll be able to get in free. But obviously you're going to be working and doing things to help out. So, so let us know. We can write your name down. Um, we need several volunteers. So, so just let us know if you're interested in that. Um, last thing is tithe and offering. We have baskets in the back you can give online. There will be a QR code up there um, that you can give. Or you can go to the website and give that way. Um, Y'all, I, I, just, I just want to say again, I'm, I'm so glad and joyful that you're here. As you took time this Sunday to show up and seek after the Lord. Um, that says a lot, and we're, we're just appreciative of you being here. Um, I'm, I'm praying, and let's just dig deeper. Is that good? Lord Jesus, I, I just say thank you. I thank you that you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. I thank you, God, that you are the name above all names, yet you still choose us. And God, this morning, we declare, not just with our action of showing up, but we declare with our minds, our hearts, and our voices that we choose you. That we want to worship you, we want to honor you, we want to exalt you this morning. Holy Spirit, be free in this place. Come and speak to our hearts. Come and move through our bodies. God, we're asking for just the supernatural to become natural this morning. God, let your kingdom come and your will be done right here in this room, right here, right now as it is in heaven. And Lord, may you be exalted to where you rightfully belong, and that is above all. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, Jesus, 
you silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence fear Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light.
It's a good day, yes? Come on now. Come on now. Man, what a powerful time. We're going to continue in the Word. If you guys would take 90 seconds, just say, say hi to one another. Ask how, you're, how each other are doing, and we'll come back, and, and we'll have a word for you guys, all right?
Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Story Church. Man, it's good to see your faces. Some of you haven't seen in a minute. We have some guests from our, our sister church, brother church, whatever you want to call it, at, at Connect Church. They, they share this building on Saturday nights. So if y'all haven't, haven't come by on a Saturday night to be a part of their service, y'all should do that. It's fantastic. Uh, Pastor Trent and his team are just amazing with genuine love, and it's, it's refreshing. I want to tell you that. It's refreshing to have unity amongst church bodies. It's not normal, and, and God's doing something new. So um, come on. We love having you guys. Man, um, I'm David Setzer. For those who don't know me, um, I'm an elder here at church, and I'm filling in for Layton. He and Melissa are at a family camp right now, him and their army of children, they, are, they have driven all the way up to South Carolina, and they're at, at a Pine Cove family camp there, um, just digging deep as a family and digging deep into the Lord and what the Lord has for them in this next season. So just be praying for them, and, and they'll be back soon. But in the meantime, I get the honor and privilege of getting to bring the word to you guys as we continue this, this mini-sermon series. Uh, we're in week two out of the three weeks. Last week, we talked about who. This week is what. Next week is when, where, and why, and and. I, our goal with this is not to make it basic head knowledge. We want to hit the heart. And so last week, we talked not so much about like, hey, who are we? Because most of us in this room know that. We have the head knowledge. And so we talked, we hit the heart. Like, hey, who are we actually being? And that we really wanted to analyze the heart. And we're going to do the same today. So let me pray us in, and we'll get going. Jesus, right now, I just surrender this morning to you. Holy Spirit, it is very evident that you're already moving in this place. You're here, and you're happy to be here. And so, and so, God, I just, I just say, be free. God, use me as a microphone for, for you and for your words and for your truth. God, anoint me, anoint my head with oil and my cup overflow and overpour into to everybody here. God, may your blood just come and anoint my tongue and my mind and my heart to be your words and not mine. God, open our hearts to receive. Let, our, let the soil of our hearts, the atmosphere of our hearts be, be ripe for fruitfulness this morning. God, I give you the freedom. This is your morning, not mine, not ours. It's your morning. So be free to do what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So y'all, when I, when I look around the church today, and not here specifically, big capital C church around the world, and, and I've had the honor of being, in several diff, being a part of several different church bodies over my life, um, some really small, some really big, and, and honestly, I see the same thing everywhere I go. I see pretty much the same thing everywhere I go. And, and what I see are four different kind of people groups. And what I see, or the first group is what I see is what I would call idolaters, all right? And this, honestly, is probably the biggest group of them. See, these people, they, they genuinely love Jesus. They do. They will show up on Sunday mornings. They, they hang on to the word that's given. They'll praise with some passion. They'll, they'll show up to a worship night or to a small group. But when you look at, at you take a step back and you look at the scope of their lives, Jesus is probably a fourth or fifth option. He's a very distant second at best. And this is a lot of us in this room. Honestly, myself, I fall into this category a lot. The worries of this world so easily replace God as our focus. And we start making those the idols in our life, not that we're bowing down and worshiping them, but we stop making him the center of it. And whether it's our families, our finances, our jobs, our issues in life, we start making those the spotlight. We start worrying and focusing on those that God ends up getting replaced and moved back down the line. All right? So that's, uh, that's one of the groups I see. The next group I see are what I call idlers, like a car just idling in place. And these people have the knowledge. They understand, hey, I need to grow. I need to mature. I need to be pushed. I need to be challenged. I need to be stretched. But I'm really, really comfortable with where I'm at. And, they, and they'll do whatever it takes to stay there. These are the people that when you come to them, say, hey, we would love help in children's ministry. Eh, no, not really my thing. Hey, we would love help with, with the worship team or the AV team so those guys can have a break. Eh, not my thing. Hey, what about leading a small group? Eh, and they'll, they'll do whatever it takes. They're going to say no to everything so they can stay in their place and just idle in place. They don't want to be stretched. They don't want to be challenged. These are the idlers, okay? The next group is what I call Sunday sitters. And these are the people who at some point in their life recently, a long time ago, they, they prayed the prayer. They asked Jesus into their heart. They accepted him as Lord and Savior. And they are utterly convinced that just showing up on Sunday morning is good enough. That they just have to show up every Sunday for the rest of their life, and they're good enough. They can go live whatever kind of life they want to live, Sunday afternoon through Saturday night. But as long as they show up to church on Sunday, they're good. And I call those, we call those the Sunday sitters. 
And then you have your group of genuine sons and daughters who are passionate about the Lord, who focus on the Lord, seek the Lord in all their things, that God is their main thing in life. And these people stick out. God said that you would shine like the, or uh, uh, Paul said in Philippians, we would shine like the stars in the sky. Like you stick out and it's genuine, it's authentic. It's not just the typical church language, the, the Christianese that you're hearing. It's, it's genuine, heartfelt love for God and they stick out. And honestly, if I'm being honest, if we were able to take a poll and this group of people made up 1%, I would be elated because I'm pretty convinced that it's much smaller than that. You just don't see it that often. You don't see people who are just passionate and pouring and seeking and pursuing the Lord. You just don't see that. And, and, and so I, it makes me ask the question, you know, what are we doing? Like, like, what are we doing as a church? What are we doing as, as individual believers? What are we doing? What are we doing? Because when I look at the church in the past, you look at Acts, Acts 2 when Pentecost comes. Okay, the Holy Spirit's poured out. Thousands of people come to know the Lord and the church is born. Just, just look at what their lives look like. You see in, in Acts 2.42, it says they, the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That was their devotion. That's what their lives were devoted to. Right? And so when we break it down real quick, that, the, the apostles' teaching, that's the Word of God because the apostles at that time, all they knew was some of the Old Testament scriptures and then they knew what Jesus taught them it's the word of God so that's what they were teaching so that they were devoted to the word of God uh, that word fellowship is, is koinonia which is 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 an interaction with others but it, it's it's with a spotlight on the on the uh, activity of the Holy Spirit the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so it's living a spirit-filled life and then there's breaking of bread which is living life with one another what we would use the word fellowship for and then you have prayer these were their devotions what are we doing? And just look at, look at the fruit from them. They, they met together every day because that's what they wanted. That was their devotion in life. They, people were being added to their number every single day. People were being added. They were so attractive and so filled with life because God was their one devotion. People were being added and saved every single day. And this is the big one. They had all things in common. <laughs> when was the last time a church body, just a church itself, all the members had all things in common, much less two different churches. It just, it doesn't exist. And so I ask the question again, what are we doing? What are we doing? And as I was praying through this, and the Lord directed me this, I was like, all right, Lord, where do you want me to go with that? He just said, go back to the foundation. You see, last week we talked about who are we being, and we talked about we're supposed to be, we all know we're supposed to be sons and daughters. That we know that, we have head knowledge of it. So what's the key to that? We talked about being poor in spirit, understanding that, that we have a lack. We have an inability to live this life he's called us to live without him. That without him, we're not able to do it. We're not able to overcome. We're not able to save our own lives. We're not able to, to do what he's called us to do at the level he wants us to do it unless it's him who's doing it through us. So being poor in spirit, those who, who seek the Lord and, and trust in him and lean on him, and say yes to him, no matter how hard it, it, he, what he's doing is, or what he's calling you to do is, or how easy it is, you still choose to lean on him and lean on his strength and his truth and his guidance, being poor in spirit, more of him and less of us. And I feel like the Lord said, the key to being poor in spirit is seeking after him. So, so last week we said, who are we being? This week is what? And the question is, what are you doing individually? What are you doing to be the son or daughter. You see, we know we need to be poor in spirit. We know we need to be sons and daughters, but what are we actively doing to be able to captivate, to be able to capture that attitude of the heart, the atmosphere of our heart that we know we need to have? And I feel like the Lord led me just one chapter over from, from what we went over last week in Matthew 5, the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He led me to chapter 6, same sermon, and it's going to be up on the screen. Chapter 6, verse 31. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first, y'all say first. first. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. You see, some of us are so worried. We, we know who we're supposed to be, yet we're so worried about all the things going on in life. We're worried about, again, work, family, um, um, issues, 
uh, entertainment, sports, screens, whatever it is that's in our life, we're so worried about that, and we, and we we're convinced that if we just seek that, it'll all take care of it. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You got it backwards. Seek me first, and all of these things will be taken care of. Seek me first. And so I ask the question, are you seeking him first? Is he the main thing in your life? See, my goal for, for this, again, my, our goal for the, this sermon series was to look at the heart. Where is our heart at as individuals? What is the main thing in your life? What do you revolve your life around? And so I feel like today we want to talk about seeking the Lord, seeking after him. That's, that's the key to, to getting that attitude of the heart. We have to pursue him. We have to chase after him so that he, we can get more of him and he can do a work in us and through us. And he gave me a picture. It's an Old Testament picture, but it's a parallel. And it's in Exodus 33. This is a parallel to what we would call the secret life with Christ. Okay, this, this Holy Spirit-led secret life with Christ. But in, in Exodus, it's called the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting. And so I'm going to read it. it. It's got a lot. It says the word tent like 10 times. So just bear with me. It'll be up on the screen. Verse 7, 33 verse 7 says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain. The tent of meeting. Okay, it was a place that God commanded Moses, hey, I want you to, to, to build this. I want you to build this. And there are, about, there are three things that I take away. The first one is this, that this is a specific, intentional place set up outside of daily life to meet with God. It is intentionally set up some distance away from the camp, which represents daily life, all the distractions, all the worries, all the family, all the things, all the entertainment. It's set up some distance away so that those, the sounds and all of that is silenced and it's just you and God. It's just you and God. And when a person wanted to inquire of the Lord, they had to leave their tent. Y'all, this is, again, this is very symbolic. They had to leave their tent, their life, all the things, and they had to go seek the Lord and go inquire of the Lord on their own. You know, if, we don't, if you don't have this in your life, you need to have it. And I mean that literally. You need to have a specific place, whether it's your, your bedroom, your living room, your back porch, your office, an extra room. You need to have a place that is your tent of meeting, that when you need to inquire and seek of the Lord, you know you can go and shut the door and leave your phone, leave everything else outside, shut that door, and it's just you and God. And you can meet with Him face to face. A tent of meeting. The second thing is this, is that it must be a priority. It's got to be something that you make a priority. See, so often we, we end up being like the, like the people who just stand and watch Moses go in and meet with God. And we stand and we watch our pastor do it. And we're like, oh, that's good enough. He'll bring us a word. Like, no, 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 no. You need to make it a priority in your life to go seek the Lord and inquire of the Lord. If you want answers to the things that are going on in your life, good answers, uh, answers for things that you're confused about, or you're frustrated or angry about, you need to seek the Lord. He's got to be the main thing in your life. He's got to be a priority. And a couple of weeks ago, I ran across this passage, and man, it's just been on my heart. I shared it with our small group on Sunday night, and it's just been sticking. And it's in Haggai. Uh, he's a minor prophet. It's in chapter 1, and this is a, it's a call to build the house of the Lord, to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And this is what this says. Y'all, listen, this is powerful stuff. Verse 5, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. How many of that feels like your life a little bit? It's like, what the heck, where all the money go? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. That's the second time he said that. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber. And build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Catch this, y'all. Catch this. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, 
because of my house, which remains a ruin while each one of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Why, declares the Lord? Why do, are things frustrating? Why are things going on? Why, why does you seem like you never have the answer? Because this, this, prior, this thing that's supposed to be a priority in your life, this secret life with Christ, this pursuit of me, is laying in ruins while you're so busy trying to focus on these things and take care of them and, and, and deal with your life yourself. It's got to be a priority. And that doesn't mean when you seek after him, all things are roses. We can see that in the book of Job, a very godly man who sought the Lord and things did not end well. But he kept seeking and he kept seeking and there were answers. And some of us, we're, 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 well, I've tried this and 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 nothing seems to work. Well, hey, have you tried seeking the Lord and seeking his wisdom and seeking his power and seeking his breakthrough? Have you tried seeking him not just once? Because listen, I said this last week. God's not some genie where you come to him and say, hey, God, I wish for this. And then you step back and, oh, well, fine. I guess you don't care about me. You didn't do it. Like, no, he doesn't want that. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants more of you. And it's got to be, he, he knows if it's a priority or not. He knows if you're genuinely seeking him or not. Because he knows your heart. And so I asked the question, where's your heart at? Is he the main thing? Is he the priority in your life? And listen, I'm not saying you can't enjoy screen time, whether that's another episode or games or whatever, or social media. I'm not saying you can't, you can't pamper a little bit or be a little lazy every now and then or take that nap or, or focus on family. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that these must be properly prioritized where they belong. And that's behind Him. It's behind Him. We've got to learn to properly prioritize our lives. So the tent of meeting is an intentional place built outside of daily life to meet with God. The second thing is that we've got to learn to prioritize this thing. It's got to be a priority. And the third thing is that we have to learn the art of remaining. Remaining. Verse 11 in Exodus, it says that, that Moses would go back to camp, go back to that daily life to deal with things, but Joshua, his young aide, would remain. And you know, I've got, I got to take a minute to show a parallel here. You see, look, the Old Testament is filled with parallels to this New Testament spirit-filled life, okay? We see that the Israelites are, are, are in bondage and slavery in Egypt, right? Over here, you see humans are in bondage and slavery to sin. God sent a deliverer in Moses to deliver the people out of that bondage, out of that slavery, and into freedom. God sent his one and only son to die for us, that we would be delivered out of that bondage and out of that slavery of sin into freedom. Are you all seeing the parallel? And then uh, God uses Moses to teach the people his ways, his commands, how he wants them to live this thing out, his laws, his, his workings, and who he is. He wants Moses to teach them and develop them. And they were only supposed to be there for a few years. Unfortunately, their unbelief and their rebellion made them stay longer. But they were only supposed to be there a few years. Over here, Jesus, for three years, are y'all catching the, the, the parallel here? For three years, poured into a group of people and showed them the kingdom of God and what this life is supposed to look like with the Holy Spirit and this access that we have to the kingdom and, and what sons and daughters actually look like. And then God rose up somebody who knew how to remain in Him to lead them into that promised land. And over here, Jesus, he, he got sent up into heaven at the right hand of God, and he sent his Holy Spirit to live in us that would remain in us so that we could live this life that we're called to live. Are y'all seeing the parallels? We've got to be like Joshua, and we've got to learn how to remain. We've got to learn how to, how to remain. God told Joshua this in Joshua 1. He says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do everything written in it, and then, y'all say then, then you will be prosperous and successful. We got to get our priorities right. We got to learn to remain in Him, and then these things will be taken care of. We'll be prosperous and, and successful as a, as a husband, as a wife. We'll be prosperous and successful as a father or a mother or as a student or a child. We'll be prosperous and successful in our, at our workplace. We'll be prosperous and successful as just a human being in our righteousness and the way we live. If we seek Him first, if we learn to remain in Him. Paul puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians. He says, Be joyful always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. 
You know how hard that is to be joyful always? You know, things pop up. You know how hard, hard it is to be joyful when somebody cuts you off? It's, it's kind of hard. It's hard to be thankful in that moment too. But when you've learned the art of remaining in Him, and, and you've remained in Him, you haven't just sought after Him, but you remain in Him throughout your day, it becomes a lot easier. Right? Paul prayed the prayer, Oh God of hope, fill me with all joy and peace in believing. Just in believing you, let that joy and peace fill me that I may abound, I may overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we are remaining in Him, joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It, it ha- it's natural for it just to bubble up out of us. And when we're seeing things from His perspective because we're remaining, it's easy to be thankful. And it's easy to pray without ceasing, which prayer is just communication with the Lord, back and forth. When you're remaining in Him, it's really easy to communicate back and forth, listen and receive and give and, and speak. Right? we got to remain. You see, you can leave the tent of meeting because eventually you got to leave that, that secret life and you've got to go back to life. You have responsibilities you got to take care of. So you can leave the tent of meeting, but the tent of meeting must not leave us. It's got to stay. It's got to stay. See, it's time the church becomes the church we've been called to be. They got it at the beginning. We saw it. In Acts 2, we saw it. They devoted themselves to these things. They were, their lives were literally devoted to God. You know, it's interesting. It doesn't mention that they devoted themselves to their spouses or their kids. They didn't devote themselves to entertainment or their jobs. Does that mean they just neglected them and gave them up? No, no. They still did those things. They still were great spouses and great parents and great kids and great students. They still were taking care of that and being responsible, but that wasn't their focus anymore. Their main thing was seeking the Lord, seeking after Him. And it's time the church started doing that again. It's time the people in the church started doing that again. It's time we start treating God like He's actually God. Like when we... When we describe God, a lot of us would have great things. Oh, he's, he's the, He made all the universe. He spoke it into existence. He knit us in our mother's womb. He's the, he's the author and creator of life. He, he's the name above all names. He sits on the throne and His enemies are His footstool. As creation, we sit at His feet. Right? We have all these great things to say about God, but then we have the audacity. We have the, the courage to say, you know what? I'm going to put you like fifth in my life. I'm, these other things are more important than you. What? It's God. Not only that, he, he came and died for you so that you could have eternal life. And, and again, we have the audacity to move him down that line and put other things in front of him and make other things more important than him. I think it's interesting that the first thing to go when we start getting busy, the first thing that typically goes out of our lives is the secret time with God. It's the first thing we take out the door. That right there speaks volumes of your heart's attitude to how important God is to you in your life. It does. And I'm guilty, guys, listen, I am not a saint up here, all right? I am just as guilty. I think it's amazing how easy and how quickly I'll, I'll get involved in, a, in an episode or something or games on my phone or, or scrolling through social media. Next thing you know, 45 minutes has passed by and I'm like, holy smokes, I, I could have done something way more productive with my life. We get, it's so easy to get distracted and caught up in this world. But we're meant to seek after him. That's what, that's what we were designed. We were designed for relationship with God to bring Him glory and to be His sons and daughters. That's what we were designed for and that should be our priority. It's time we start treating Him like the God that He is and it's time we start seeking Him. And I'm going to say this, y'all. If you're not reading this regularly, you're wrong. I'm just going to say that right now. You're rebellious and you're not being obedient. He wants you. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. If you're not getting in the Word of God, Good luck to you. Because here's the thing. I know people in my life who, who I have people in my life that I know they don't read this word very much at all. And then I'll be talking with them and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I was praying. I feel like God told me to do this and God told me to do this. And I'm sitting back and I'm going, you know, I, I'm not some Bible expert, but that does not line up much with the word of God. Like that doesn't seem like the character of God. That doesn't seem like something he would tell his people to do. And so I don't say anything because I don't want to question their relationship with the Lord. I don't know where their hearts are. I'm not going to about to say that that wasn't maybe God, you know, God is way smarter than I am. So I'm not about to tell them that wasn't God. But then they go and they start doing those things and it doesn't work out. It doesn't seem to work. Something falls apart and they're like, man, I just don't understand. I don't get it. Well, here's the thing, y'all. We have an enemy who is phenomenal at impersonating God. 
He is phenomenal at it. Like, you can go watch videos of people impersonating famous people, and they're really good. Satan is like times a thousand of that level. He can make himself sound exactly like God, but he'll give you about a 99% truth. And that 1%, you'll start walking on that 1% false, that 1% lie. And, and as you go, you're like, oh, well, I'm still on the path. And then you take about 100 steps and you realize the path is like right there now because it's just 1%. And you're like, oh, it's just right there. I'm still on the path. When really, you're actually not. But you get about 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 steps a couple months down the road and the path's way over there and you're like, uh-oh. Because the enemy is really good at trying to sound like God, but then he, he just corrupts it just a little bit to get you off. And here's the thing, if you know what this says, if you know what the promises of God are, you'll, know what, you'll be able to call Him out. Jesus says that, that my sheep will know me by my voice. Well, here's the thing, if you blindfolded me and my parents came in the room and you brought people who could impersonate them perfectly, I would be able to tell who my parents are because I know exactly what they would say. I know what their voices would say to me. And I know the slang they would use, I know the phrases they would say, and these people wouldn't know that because they don't know the heart of my parents like I do. And it's the same thing with God. If we know the word of God, we know what he would say. We know what his character is. We know what his heart is. When the enemy comes and tries to speak to us, we're like, oh, no, 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 no. That is not what God would be telling me right now. Because I know the voice of my father. I know the heart of my father. Do you all understand? If you're not getting in the word, you better get in it. Especially in times like today. You better get in it and you better know what truth is. It's time to seek him in word and in prayer. You see, the tent of meeting is an absolute necessity. It's an absolute necessity for those who truly desire to be sons and daughters of God. Absolute necessity. We talked about it last week. We know we want to be sons and daughters of the King. That's who we've been called to be. And the attitude of the heart that will help us get there is being poor in spirit, leaning on Him and trusting in Him. And through that, He opens the doors for His resources. He opens the doors for His authority. He opens the doors for His movement in our life. But in order to get there, we have to seek Him. We have to seek Him. And the greatest thing is, this isn't even, this isn't even where the promises are. Look, look it says, it says in, that, in that verse in Matthew, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. All these things will be added to you as well. In other words, and I said this earlier, you see, we have it backwards. We focus on all these things, and then we'll try to fit God in where, where there's time left, if we have time, if we have enough energy, if we're not tired and need to go to bed. We'll, we'll, we'll fit God in. And God's saying, no, 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 no. Seek me first, and I'll add these to you. When you add something on, that means there's something already there. So what he's saying here, he said, if you'll seek me and my kingdom first, and my righteousness first, you're going to have everything you could ever need. You'll have everything you, you could ever need. But because I'm good, I'm going to add these things onto you as well. I'm going to take care of these, these worries in your life. It says it like this in Psalms. It says, delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. That word delight means enjoy. Take joy and want to spend time with, want more of. And God's saying, if you'll want more of me, these desires to be a good spouse, to be a good worker, to be a good boss, to being a good child or a student, to being a good uh, a Christian, to, to walking in victory, these desires, on top of any other desires you have for your future, for your gifts and talents, for your anointings, I will give you those, but you have to seek me. Because when you seek me, you have everything you, ha you need. But because I'm good, I give you the desires of your heart as well. In Jeremiah, it says this, seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, seeking God, we said we need to get in the Word, we need to pray, we need to have that secret time of life, or secret time with, with God. But seeking Him isn't going, all right, let me read you know, two verses, all right, God, see you later. That's not seeking Him. Seeking Him isn't coming and bringing your list of demands, your list of, all right, Lord, this is the things I need you to do in my life. Hope you take care of those, I'll come back and we'll talk about it. Like, no, 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 that's not seeking Him. Seek Him with all your heart. Shut the door and spend time with Him. I would say 20, 20 to 30 minutes. Just, just, and if you want to do more than that, go for it. I know a lot of us do have things going on in life. But if you can spend 20 to 30 minutes where you can get into the Word and meditate on it for a little bit. God, what are you saying in this? Speak to me. And if you can, if you can spend time meditating in prayer, pick a few of those, of those prayer requests that you have and say, God, I need you in this. What are you saying about this situation? God, I need provision for this. I need breakthrough in this. What are you saying? And then seek Him. Bring your heart Seek Him with all of your heart, not just because you know it's a checkbox to do, but with all your heart because it's something you want to do. It's time the church becomes the church, y'all. 
And listen, I'm not trying to say the legalistic. I'm not trying to make it like that. It's got to become an attitude of the heart. We're trying to get at the heart here. It, it, I'm, it, I'm not saying if you miss a day, like, oh, you know, Monday, I didn't spend time with the Lord. No, you're going to hell. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, is it's got to be the attitude of your heart that you want more of him. He's got to be the main thing in your life. That, that all these things that you, revol- that you make him revolve around, you got to flip it and make it a revolve around him. It's just like the solar system. The sun is the middle, and it brings warmth, and it brings life. And that's what God should be doing for us. He brings that life. He brings that gravitational pull that keeps us in our correct orbit of life. And so often we take him out of it, and we start putting finances, family, all these things in the middle, and we wonder why our life doesn't seem to be orbiting the way we we think it should be. And we wonder why there's not near as much life and joy coming to us as there should be. Well, maybe you take that out and put the sun, put the son of God back in the middle where it's supposed to be, and next thing you know, everything starts getting in its right alignment. And even in the midst of difficult times, there's a joy, and there's a thankfulness, and there's a peace, and there's a rest in it. See, we, we complain about the state of the world so often, politically, economically, um, and the entertainment industry, I mean, you, you name it, the sports industry, I mean, we complain about all the things. Guilty. But here's the thing, if you want to see the change, you got to be that change you want to see. And it starts with you individually. It starts with your heart. God, I want you more. And you start bringing that discipline and that, that sacrifice and that priority, and it becomes a part of who you are. Next thing you know, there's an empowerment inside of you because you're chasing after him and you're leaning on him and, and you're being that poor in spirit son or daughter of the king that you're meant to be. You gotta be the change that you wanna see in the world. You gotta seek him first. And, and what happens is when we seek him first, we start bringing other people alongside of us and we teach that to them and we rub off on them and they start seeking him first. And then we raise up a whole new generation of people who seek him first. And the next thing you know, we have people in those political offices that are seeking God first. And we have people in the economic realms that are seeking God first. And we have people in the entertainment industry, the sports industry, the, the social media industry that are seeking God first. And we start seeing the changes that we desire to see. But it starts with you. It starts with you. You see, when, when Leighton and Melissa planted a church here, a lot of people asked him questions like, why love it? And we got hundreds of churches here. Why in the world would you bring another church to Lubbock? Like, at one time, it may be the same, but at one time, Lubbock was like one of the top cities in America of, of churches per capita. Like, do we really need another church? But God led them here. And the question is, well, how are you going to be any different? This is how. If we have a church body, because I've never seen it, a genuine full church body that as individuals in that church, God is the priority, God is the main thing, could you imagine the impact that would have in society? Because every single one of us in this room have different bubbles of life. I'm an educator. I know some of us work in finances, some of us work in the ag, some of us work with, with oil and industries. Like We have a bunch of different, we have medical field around here, we have airport stuff, we have all the things. Think about what the impact we could have if we as individuals start start working and digging deep into God and seeking Him first and start rubbing off on other people in our bubbles and what that could look like. And so as I told you all last week, my goal every time I get up here isn't just to give you head knowledge. I want to give you practical application that you can apply when you walk out this door. That, I'm a teacher at heart. That's what I want to do. I want you to be able to live at a higher level when you walk out these doors than you did when you were walking in. And so what I have in every seat is a note card. And if you need another one, you can grab, there's plenty, there's several empty seats. So just grab another one. There's pins all around. Uh, They all should work, but no promises. Again, we have extras if you need one. We're going to give you two minutes, y'all, two minutes. What I want from you, and if you're watching online, you can just use a, a piece of paper. I want you to write all seven days of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And next to each day, you're going to write the time, in the place that you plan on seeking after the Lord that day. And again, I I would encourage you to to at least plan for 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, If you want to go longer, that's great. But just giving God five minutes, that's not exactly seeking Him with with all your heart. Okay, So at least 20 to 30 minutes to really spend time with Him. All right, so I'm going to give you two minutes to do that. You guys go.
about 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. All right. Now listen, again, if you miss a day, it's okay. It's okay. All right? But it needs to be a, a, a priority to you. Like, you know what? I missed today, but tomorrow, Dad Gummit, I'm going to be spending time with God. No matter what, I'm spending time with Him, right? And I would even say, especially if this isn't a practice in your life already, if you can hit four or five days, that's just over half of the week, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Because you can build on that. And the more you do that, then it'll be five or six days. And then you build on that, and it just becomes a desire. And it becomes an attitude of the heart. It becomes the atmosphere of who you are. I've got to spend time with God. It becomes a priority. And you'll notice when you start traveling, you know what, i got to build in time. i got to wake up a little bit early. I want to spend time with God before we start doing our vacation stuff because it's that important to me. You'll notice it when, when you're crazy busy. You know what, this can, stuff can wait because I've got to spend time with God. Okay? And here's the thing. I said this last week. All right, when we get up here, when pastors get up here, our job is to equip you guys, to empower you guys, to bring truth to you, to bring knowledge and, and revelation about who you are called to be and, who you're, and what you're called to do. But when you walk out those doors, we can't force you to do it. You have to take responsibility for it. So you have a tool in your hand. You have a schedule in your hand of when you can spend time with God. And I get it. Some of you have families. Some of you have things going on. But it's got to be a priority. Work with your spouse. Work with each other and say, hey, i got to shut the door and i got to spend time with God. Can I have 20 or 30 minutes? Absolutely, go do that. I'll take care of dinner. I'll take care of the laundry. I'll, whatever. Work with each other, okay? But it's got to be your responsibility because if we as individual church members start pulling, start the phrases to put up or shut up, right? We start doing our thing and doing what we're called to do when we come together as a church body and all of the parts and all of the members are doing what they're supposed to do, the, the body can work the way it's supposed to be working. Be the body part that you're meant to be. Be that member you're meant to be, who God has called you to be, which is more than a conqueror, a priestly warrior, one who's supposed to go and, and do incredible things and shine like stars in the nighttime. Shine like a star where you are, and it starts with seeking Him. It starts with seeking Him. Okay? So next week, when I ask you guys how it went, I need you to be honest with me. Don't start making excuses. I'm a middle school coach. I deal with excuses all day, every day. Just be honest with me. Just be honest. You know what, David? Instead of like hee-hawing around, yeah, you know, I just got, no, no, no. You know what, David? It just really wasn't that big of a priority to me. And I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to say, you know what? I appreciate that honesty. In fact, that's a huge step because you recognize the issue. It's not a priority. So this next week, let's change that. Let's take a step in the right direction. Let's make it more of a priority. And you can do the same to me. And if I start making excuses, David, 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 I don't want to hear excuses. Be honest with me. Like, yeah, you're right. It wasn't that big of a priority to me. You're right. All right, let's, let's be there for each other and love on each other. Be honest with one another and build each other up. That's what we're meant to be. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to bless you guys. We're going to have some people up here praying for you. If you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray. We believe in the miraculous working of God. We believe in His, His, His salvation. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit for physical healing, mental, emotional healing. We believe in Him for breakthrough, for, for healing in relationships. We believe in Him for provision. We just believe in the miraculous working of God in all aspects of life. So if you need prayer for anything, Come up here. We would love to pray for you, get to know you a little bit. And, uh, and yeah, so let me bless you guys. Y'all stand real quick. Lord Jesus, I just say thank you. I thank you for this morning. I thank you, Lord, that somehow, some way, you made this sermon 10 minutes less than what it was when I was practicing. I praise the Lord for that. I thank you, God. Jesus, I pray for every person here that we would understand who you've called us to be, but we would also understand what we need to do to get there, which is just seek after you because you're the one who does it in us and through us. We can't just sit back and expect you to do everything for us. We have got to seek after you. And just as your word says, when we come to you, you will be quickly come to us. When we step, make a step towards you, you'll quickly run the rest of the way and meet us because you love us and you desire us. And so God, right now, I bless every person here with, the, I just declare a desire for more of you, a desire for a greater measure of you. That, that seeking you and being with you, the secret place, the what behind the who would be a priority to every person in this room. 
and that everything else would fall in its proper prioritization, which is behind you, because when everything is behind you, it gets taken care of in a greater capacity than it could when we try to put it in front of you and do it ourselves. So Lord, right now, I just pray that you would, every person here, you would bless them and keep them. Let your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. Would you turn your countenance towards them and give them peace that when they walk out these doors, they may be the sons and daughters that you've called them to be and they may be able to live in the power and the authority that you've called them to have. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, y'all. For lunch today, um, for those who don't know, we try to have lunch every Sunday together just as a body. We love community and we want community. We want to know each other, get to know each other. Um, and we try to rotate places. This week we're going to be at Roses down the street. Um, if you have any suggestions, let us know because we pretty much hit like the same three or four places. And really, we just want somewhere that's obviously not going to cost an arm and a leg, but also somewhere where we can be together. We can move some tables and be together and, and a lot of places don't have that. So um, if you have ideas, think about it, let us know. But uh, we're going to meet at Roses today. And uh, yeah, you guys have an amazing day.